all for giving me your time and for joining us today. Um, it's, it's such an honor to, to be with you and to have all of you just really sharing time and space with me. I'm, I fundamentally believe that time is our most precious non-renewable resource. And the fact that you are generous enough to share yours with me um, means more to me than you'll ever know. So thank you for that. Um, I'm incredibly excited. And I love seeing some names I recognize um, popping up. So hi, Sandra, great to see you. Hope you're feeling better. All right, so let's see if I can figure out how to click through. For those of you who don't know me, I wanna share just a little bit about myself. Um, so I have over 20 years in the human resources space, um, and I've always had my hands very deeply in talent acquisition. I have been a senior director, a VP over the entire talent acquisition function, um, and all the way up to chief human resources officer. Um, so there, there aren't many roles within the HR, TA, and recruiting space that I haven't done either personally or um, have led others through the role. And a big part of my work in talent acquisition over the years has been to develop interview processes, selection tools, applicant tracking systems. Um, so I've worked hand in hand with folks to truly develop the systems and tools used by recruiters and interviewers to help select people. And as I myself was impacted by COVID-19 and my role as Chief Human Resources Officer was eliminated at my former company, I decided to launch my own business. And in, in recognizing how many millions of people were also impacted by COVID and had job losses, I realized there would also be a lot of people looking to rejoin the workforce and Frankly, I saw a lot of really bad advice being shared on the internet, and I just, I, I wasn't comfortable with it. So I wanted to bring forward um, truth-based, reality-based, factual, experience-based advice and insights to people who are in the interview process or who are interested in perhaps interviewing or making a career change. Um, Throughout my career, I have facilitated the hiring of over 25,000 people. Um, I've worked for some of the world's largest uh, global organizations, and I've also worked for startups and small companies. So I, I run the gamut of company size, company scope, industry. So I've got a pretty diverse background, which I think serves me very well. Um, and lastly, I will share with you that Barbie is my legal name. And you might ask, why would I put that on a slide? I can share with you that I am asked literally every single day if Barbie Winterbottom is actually my name or if I made it up. And I assure you, I did not. Barbie is on my birth certificate. It's not a nickname. It's not short for Barbara. It is Barbie. So there you have it. The mystery is now solved. It is actually my name. I even have relatives who don't believe me and I show them a copy of my birth certificate. So it's a real thing. So, all right, so what else? Um, you know, I wanna share with you, my belief is that we all have the power and the ability to deliver an amazing interview, right? We all have everything it takes right now to be amazing in interviews, but we just, haven't been given the tools or understand what's really needed. It's, it's almost like it's a different language. And if you've ever traveled somewhere where they don't speak your language or you don't speak their language, it, if someone asks you a question, it doesn't mean you don't know the answer. It just might mean that you don't understand what they're asking you because you're not speaking their language. And that's kind of how I feel about interviewing. It's not that you don't have the answers or the information, but you're just not really understanding what it is they're asking you and what they want to hear from you. So I'm hoping we can get into some of that today and I can help you with that. So, you know, one of the things I want us to talk about today is um, 
how do you talk about yourself in an interview? How do you talk about your resume in an interview? And how do you talk about failure? These are the three most asked questions I get around interviewing is how do I, how do I answer these questions? So I want to jump into that first. Um, I do actually have a list of questions. So thank you for those of you who have submitted questions already. And for those of you who have not, but you do have questions, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A or in the chat. And um, either Casey or myself will do our best to make sure we get the answers out to you. All right, everybody with me so far? Everybody good? Oh, one other thing I'd like to share with you all is that if you are interested in sharing your LinkedIn profile in the chat, please do that now, share it with everyone. Um, because I, I just, I truly, truly believe in the power of community and that the more we connect and share with others, the more support and um, our network just grows. And you never know, who you might connect with who might have that next great job opportunity or know someone who used to work somewhere you're interested in working so please feel free to share your linkedin profiles in the chat so that we can all connect with one another and if you're not already connected with me please reach out and connect with me on linkedin i would love to chat with you guys all right so the first question i want to field and i'm asked this all the time and i i also see a lot of folks posting about this particular issue. And I will give you this caveat. Many of the people who I see posting about this particular thing are third party recruiters or recruiting agencies. And there's this, this perception that there's a hidden job market. I don't know if any of you have heard this before or seen this about what you really need to focus on is the hidden job market. I want to clarify with everyone that there is no hidden job market. It is not literal. What people mean when they say is there a, there's a hidden job market is there are jobs that are opened up within an organization that may never be posted to a site like Indeed or LinkedIn or Career Builder or whatever job sites um, you might be used to going to. What organizations do is they send them to a headhunter or a third party recruiter and those individuals mine databases, they mine in LinkedIn, they mine in lots of different areas to pluck candidates and present them to an organization. So there is not a literal hidden job market. What folks are referring to when they say that is the power of networking and jobs that never actually get posted on job boards. And so if you want to get exposure to this quote unquote hidden job market, my recommendations would be to connect with um, recruiting agencies, headhunters, especially folks who specialize in your area. So if you're a human resources professional, you want to connect with um, recruiters and headhunters who specialize in placing human resources folks. You want to make sure you connect with a recruiter or a headhunter who gets to know you, who understands your skills, strengths, and abilities. So set up time to chat with them. You want to network with people who work for a company that you might be interested in working for. So there's lots of things you can do to potentially tap into this um, hidden job market. So I, if anybody else has any other questions about that particular issue um, or, or area, you know, submit them in the Q&A. But I did want to first and foremost dispel the myth that there's like an underground hidden job market um, because there's not. <laughs> so that's the first thing. The first and biggest question I'm asked or most frequently asked question is, how do I answer, tell me about yourself? And I know that can be daunting. Tell me about yourself um, is an icebreaker question that interviewers often use to kind of initiate the conversation. And tell me about yourself and walk me through your resume 
are often the same question. And as a job seeker, I want you to think about it as the same question. Because when they say, when they ask you to tell me about yourself, they don't really want to know about your grandma and your childhood favorite dog and all of the personal things that make you you. What they want to know is about you as it relates to your career. They want to know about you as it relates to why you're interested in this position, what has you interested in that organization, and what makes you special or unique, or what skills do you have that might be attractive to them as an employer. That's what they're asking you when they say, tell me about yourself. Now, that doesn't mean you can't talk about some personal things. As an example, if you are a passionate runner and you wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and you run for three miles or five miles or whatever a passionate runner does, clearly looking at me, you can tell I am not a passionate runner, but maybe let, we'll go with three miles. Well, that might be something worthwhile to bring up. It lets them know a little bit about you as a person. And the way you could bring that into the conversation is, well, one of the things I do on a daily basis as I start my day is I wake up at 5 a.m. every morning and I run uh, for three miles. I find that that really just clears my head. It gives me a great start for the day so that I can focus on the work ahead of me and, and the things I need to do and accomplish throughout my day. That's a great way of sharing something that's a little bit personal, but it's not sticky. It doesn't take you down um, a path that they don't need to know. So those types of things, if you're, if you're a musician, if you have a hobby, those are great things to bring in. But again, I would challenge you to bring it in in the context of you, you as a professional. So the runner ex example, talks about how it sets your day so that you can be productive, right? If you're a musician, you might say, well, I, I, I play in a band and it's a great stress release for me. I love it. I also find that music really helps your, your brain activity. And so after work twice a week um, or in the evenings twice a week, I have a, a practice with a band and we play every once in a while. And it's, it's, it's great fun for me. And I find it allows me to focus on work things when I'm at work and fun things when I'm outside of work. So those are just some examples of some things you can do. Um, the other question of walk me through your resume. This one, um, I, I, I've interviewed hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people throughout my career. And one of the most confusing things a candidate can do is to walk us through your resume from current and go backwards. Make sure when, if someone says, walk me through your resume, you start with your earliest experience and move forward to today. And the reason that's so important is one, we want to see your career progression and we wanna hear your perspective of your career progression. So if you do it by starting with where you are now and go backwards, it just doesn't resonate well with the person on the other side of the interview desk or these days on the other side of the video camera. So you wanna make sure you start at the beginning and, and bring it forward. I always recommend to have one or two highlights from each position you've had or each company you've worked for. Maybe bring up, um, a great project you worked on, or if the culture was amazing at an organization, um, if you built great relationships, if you learned something really special there, if they had an amazing product or you were part of um, a merger or an acquisition or the launch of something wonderful. So bringing forward a few nuggets about each company you worked for um, really helps them uh, understand a bit about you and how you relate to the jobs you've had. Now, if you've been working for more than 20 years, I encourage you to find a starting off place that might not be at the very beginning. 
if you've had multiple jobs, right? The average person stays at a company between two and five years. So if you've been working for 20 years and you've been at somewhere for every two years, you could have had 10 jobs. Well, that's a pretty lengthy conversation if you're bringing up a few nuggets here and there about each company you worked for um, or each position you've had. So if you've worked for more than 20 years, you may not wanna start all the way at the beginning and go company by company. You may wanna kind of cluster the initial few positions you've had together by saying, you know, early in my career, I was just starting out and I was fortunate to work for X company in a very entry level position, really got my feet wet and, and learned how to build relationships, learned how to navigate in an organization. And it was great experience. It took me to my next two or three jobs. And when I really started to thrive in my career was here at this organization. And then you can start walking by position by position up to today. So you may not wanna go through all of it because if you do, it could take you an hour and there goes the entire interview. So I encourage you to practice walking through your resume from beginning to now. And it's amazing to me that people don't actually practice this, but practice it. Practice saying it out loud, write down some highlights of each position that you wanna bring forward when they say, walk me through your resume. All right, so there's that. Um, failure, that's the other big one. How do I talk about failure? Let me shine some light on this question because I ask people about failure all the time. And I ask people about failure, not because I'm interested in what they actually failed at. I ask them about failure because I'm interested in how they recovered. What did they actually do after the failure? And I also want to emphasize this. Failure does not have to mean something catastrophic. It doesn't have to mean that an entire project launch or product launch failed and didn't happen. It doesn't mean that the entire system came to a screeching halt and you couldn't do any, um, payments for three weeks. Failure could mean missing a deadline. Failure could mean not accomplishing 100% of the goal you set out to accomplish, right? So failure doesn't have to be catastrophic failure. It could mean a miss, an oversight, or something like that. And what I want to hear when I ask that question is I want to clearly understand the situation what your responsibilities were, what the failure point was, and here's the key. What I want to hear is, once you recognized the failure point, what did you do then? Did you go back and research what you could have done differently to avoid the failure? Do you go back and correct it and keep moving? Do you recognize what you learned and apply it to the next thing? Like, what did you do next is what we want to hear when we ask about failure. We also want to hear that you own your mistakes, that you acknowledge that you actually made a mistake. We all do. I make mistakes every single day. Trust me, every day. So owning your mistakes is also a very core value that interviewers want to hear. Are you willing to acknowledge when you didn't quite hit the mark. All right, so I hope that helps in those three areas. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, another one, does applying for a job in a different state hurt my chances of getting hired? Um, I don't think it hurts your chances of getting hired. However, there are companies out there who have budgets to pay for relocation, and there are companies that don't. So if you're wanting to move to a particular geography, so you're applying for jobs in that area, you want to make sure it's very clear that you're moving to that geography on your own dime, that you're not looking for relocation. Now, if you are looking for relocation assistance, then you wanna make that clear as well. So it doesn't, I don't believe that it really hurts your chances. The only time that it would even be a consideration for me is that if I saw a job posting that read 
local candidates only. And then I would ask why it states that. And usually it's because they're not offering relocation, in which case, if you're willing to pay to relocate on your own dime, then you can make that clear as well. So hopefully that gives you some insight there. Uh, let's see, when reading a resume, what red flags do recruiters look for? When reading a resume, recruiters look for spelling mistakes. They look for typos. They look for poor formatting. They also look for um, consistent progression or lateral moves that make sense. Not everybody always moves up the chain. There are times when people move into lateral roles or even take a step back to learn a new skill, to get into a new industry, or perhaps there's something in their personal life that they wanted to take less responsibility at work, so they took a step back. So they look for those. I wouldn't necessarily call them red flags. I mean, the typos and the grammatical errors and the spelling errors, those are red flags, absolutely. But the other things, they look for them, not because they're necessarily red flags, but because they're things they'll want to, to dig into a little bit more. They'll also look if there's big gaps in employment. Um, and again, not necessarily a red flag, but just a question. Hey, I see you didn't work for five years. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? And a way to respond to that is if you wanted to stay home with your kids, maybe you decided I, it was important to you. So simply stating that. I made the decision to be a stay-at-home parent with my children until they got into first grade. And then I am now joining the workforce. That's all you have to say. I've had people say, well, I had an aging parent and I had to take some time off to be their full-time caregiver. Okay. So it's, it's fine if you have those gaps, as long as you can speak to them. All right. Uh, let's see. How do I respond to what's my biggest weakness? This is also a question that I have been asked before. I don't typically ask this question of people. Um, I, I feel like it kind of freaks them out a little bit, but what interviewers are looking for is, do you know who you are? Are you in touch with what you're good at? And are you in touch with what you're not good at? And again, just like in the failure question, what do you do to support your weaknesses? And as in anything in life, too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. So when I've been asked this question, I try to respond by actually talking about one of my strengths that I might overutilize a bit, which then could become a weakness. So I, I would never say, well, you know, I just suck at X, Y, and Z. That's not a great way to respond to that question. A better way might be, well, I, I have an extreme bias for action and I am always ready to jump in and get as much done as I possibly can. And when I'm not really careful about managing my schedule, I have at times found myself double booked and having to, at the last minute, rearrange my schedule, which is a bad experience for my candidates or my internal customers. So I have to be very, very cognizant of not over committing because I, in my own mind, think I can do it all, fix it all, solve it all, and I want to, but I have to recognize my own limitations and time constraints. That is a perfect way to respond to, tell me about your greatest weakness. You really talk to them about one of your greatest strengths. I believe my bias for action is one of my greatest strengths, but my example that I just shared with you is true. I believe I can do it all. And so I end up over committing, double booking, triple booking. Um, Casey, who's on the call, can attest to that being a true statement. Um, so I really do have to work at managing my calendar very, very carefully. And if it's not on my Outlook calendar, it's not going to happen. So utilizing those things about yourself that are actually strengths, but when overutilized become a weakness is a great way to answer that question. Hopefully that helps whoever wanted to know. All right, um, how do I respond when someone asks about salary expectations? As a former recruiter, I can tell you that one of my biggest pet peeves has always been when I ask a candidate what they're looking for from a compensation perspective 
and they give me a non-answer. I can tell you that on more than one occasion, I have failed to move forward with a candidate if they will not answer the question. And there's a reason for that. If you are a candidate and you're looking for $150,000 a year, and I know as a recruiter, the top budget is 75, that's likely a gap we're not gonna be able to close. So I am not looking to nail somebody into an exact dollar amount, nor are recruiters trying to lowball you by asking you this question. But here's the thing, guys. You all have a bottom line. You know what number, what threshold you absolutely cannot drop below. And if you don't know that, I recommend you figure that out because that's crucial. If you didn't need a paycheck, Think about it like this. We would all be blissfully volunteering at all of the charities in the world that exist that need our time and our efforts, but we don't. We work because we need a paycheck. So this compensation question is very important. You need to know your value. You need to know your numbers. And a way to respond to that is, there's many ways you can respond to it. You can say, well, I'd love to know more details about the position and the responsibilities and if I would be leading people or an individual contributor, but I can tell you that my bottom line for a position where I'm leading a team is $75,000 a year, right? And the recruiter will likely be like, okay, that's great. That's within my range. We're good to go. And that's all you need to talk about. Or you could give them a range, or you could say what I made at my last position or what I'm looking for. There's lots of ways to respond. Now, a caveat to that is you don't have to tell them how much you made at your last position. In, I think, 11 states already, it's actually illegal to ask people what they made at their former company and more and more states are adopting it. Um, so it's not illegal in every state to ask that, but it is in, I believe, 11 states right now. So you may not want to refer to what you made at your last job, but you want to know your number and you want to give them your number. And if you throw out a number and say you say 75,000 and they come back and they say, well, that's really, that's out of our range. Unfortunately, we can't, I don't think I can meet you there. You can always come back with, well, what, what are you able to do? What do you think the, the position would offer? Because I, I'm really interested in the role and perhaps I can review my, my expenses and figure out a way to make it happen. So if you want to do that, that's a way to handle that. So don't feel like you're putting yourself in a box that you can't get out of. Um, yes, Alexandra, New York is included in the 11, absolutely. Florida is not. <laughs> I wish it were, but we're getting there, I'm sure. Um, and yes, I agree. Um, junior screeners ask every day. And if you're in a state where it's illegal, you should know that. And you could say, well, I'm not comfortable answering that question. I'm not sure it's a question that this state allows, but I can tell you this is what I'm looking for, right? So there, again, there's another, there's always a way to bring it back around. All right, uh, let's see. Let me see, Do our, Casey, we've had some questions coming in and I haven't been able to check on all of them yet. So let me see here. Yep, I, I, actually get... I texted you this on Barbie if you want. Oh, you did? Trouble. Yep. All right, okay. Um, let me open up my phone. Oh, hang on. I have to take my phone off of airplane mode then. Hope my phone doesn't ring, guys. Okay. So whatever you text me did not come through case because I was on airplane mode. I'm sorry. Um, but I do see, here's one. Um, I left my job for personal reasons. How to answer why you left your previous job. There's, there's lots of people who leave their previous employers for personal reasons. And um, what I would recommend is to find a valid response that allows people to, to be comfortable with, with what you're saying. Um, if it's something you absolutely will not disclose, that's okay. 
um, you can simply say, well, I, I had some personal reasons for leaving my former employer. It had nothing to do with the job. It had nothing to do with my boss. I loved where I worked. It was great. Um, I, I just had some things in my personal life that required me to have to leave. And all of that's been taken care of and I'm ready to rejoin the workforce. I'm completely committed or what have you. So, it, you know, if, if you left for personal health reasons or what have you, you don't have to disclose that. But what you wanna make sure you do share with them is that whatever the reason was that had you leave your previous job, it's been taken care of and you are now fully prepared and ready to join the workforce full throttle. Um, if you left your previous employer because of personal reasons about working there, that's a whole different ball game. And you want to be very um, tactful about a response uh, that has to do with perhaps you didn't like your boss. Um, maybe you weren't meeting performance expectations. Maybe you were terminated. Who knows? Like there's so many things that could happen, right? So you want to practice responding to that question so that it's very easy for you and, and it doesn't feel like you're struggling to come up with an answer. But one way you could answer that is, um, I, I made the decision to leave my former employer. I recognized it was just not the right fit for me. And it's important for me to feel very aligned with an organization. And so I made the difficult decision to move on so that I could seek the best opportunity and um, alignment and fit for me. That's all you have to say. Do not trash your former employer, right? It's not the time, it's not the place. I'm not saying make it up. I'm not saying lie about it, but be tactful about it. A, an astute interviewer can read between the lines and know what you're saying without having to go into great detail. So hopefully that helps. Um, expected pay, is that total compensation or base salary? You know, it depends on the person asking the question, Chris. So I would ask that as a clarifying question. If someone asks me, what are you looking for in compensation? I would be clear and say, well, from a base perspective, I'm looking for this. From a total compensation perspective, I'm looking for base plus this percent of bonus, medical, dental, vision, 401k, vacation, like what, are, what all the different elements are. So you want to ask that as a clarifying question. Are you asking me about total compensation or are you asking me specifically about base salary? And that will clarify that. And no one is offended when you ask that question. You're welcome, Chris. Um, let's see. How can you address an offer that you know is below the market rate and the posting has been open for more than 60 days as a result of the gap? Um, so one, the market rate and the budget for the company are two very different things. And I've had this happen to me, so I can tell you, um, the market rate is just a number that exists in the universe, right? And, and usually economic development councils and, and salary surveys and lots of companies um, come up with what a quote unquote market rate is. And that's great. But if the company doesn't have the budget to pay that, market rate doesn't matter. Like companies aren't required to pay market rate. Companies pay what they can afford to pay to attract and retain the talent they want and need. So if, if, a, if a position is well below market, I would address that and say, you know, if, if you're looking for something that you know on average is a $75,000 a year position and they are offering 60, you may want to address that and say, I, I'm not comfortable because that's really below market for this job. Um, you know, if you think about uh, like California, San Francisco, Silicon Valley, New York City, um, really expensive places to live. There's city, state, county taxes. There's all these things that exist that don't exist in other geographies. And if those are real uh, challenges, you can certainly bring them up and say, I, I, I don't think I can do that. That's well below market rate and that's not a living wage in this market. Unfortunately, it's not a position I'm able to move forward with. And if they're really interested in you, they'll 
figure out a way to meet you where you need to be. And if they're not, then it's not the right role for you. So I, I don't know that you're going to be able to change an, a company's internal compensation structure. And it's really not even a battle I would try to fight. I would simply make sure you know your numbers and that you have the data behind it and that you're able to articulate what you're looking for. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, okay. Now the texts are coming through. All right. Um, how do you address why should I hire you? Why are you better than other candidates when you have no idea who else is competing against you? That's a great question. Um, so if somebody's asking you why you're better than other candidates, I would be really honest and direct and say, I'm not sure because I don't know who the other candidates are, but I can tell you what I bring to the table. That's how I would respond to that. I've, I've personally never asked anybody what makes you better than other candidates. Um, that's a hypothetical question and I don't like asking hypothetical questions. So being prepared to respond to that is, is key. Um, if they ask you why we should hire you, then that's a response you need to be prepared with. And I would absolutely make sure you know how to answer that. Anchor it in the core competencies of the job posting. Anchor it in the skills and the experience you have. Anchor it in your passion for the role and why you're interested in that company. And please don't say I'm interested in working here because I need a job. That's great, we all get that. That's kind of a given. Um, find something about that company that is interesting to you. Maybe you like the involvement that company has in your local community. Maybe there's um, some, some products that they offer that are really intriguing to you. Maybe they're really well known for being a progressive marketing organization and you're a marketing person. So you're attracted to that company because you want to work at a very progressive marketing organization. So you wanna know why you want to work there. And then you want to also know what makes you qualified and what you could bring to the organization, right? It's about what you can add to that team. It's not about fitting in, it's about what you can do to add to the value. So I hope that helps. Um, if I left my last job, oh, I answered that one. How do you handle when, when a recruiter asks you about why you left a role after two years? Um, I would be surprised if you guys are asked that. The average is two to five years these, nowadays. Um, and first I would ask yourself, why did you leave the job after two years? Um, maybe you were recruited into another role, right? That's happened to me. I've been at companies for two years. I've been at companies for less than two years. And I was approached by another employer and I was offered a, a role that was a higher level, um, greater responsibilities, greater compensation. So it, I was able to move my career up that ladder by making strategic decisions of when to move on from one company to the next. So it, it really does depend on why you left, but formulating your answer is the key here and making sure that it makes sense to the person on the other side of the desk. Um, so why you left is, is certainly unique to you, but isn't anything I'd be worried about. Um, again, knowing that two to five years is the average, I, I would be surprised if somebody got really hung up on two years. Uh, let's see. How do you address, why should I hire you? We did that. How do you negotiate a salary with a bonus amount offered? Um, so if bonus is included in your total compensation, there's a couple of things I would ask. Um, what is the bonus structure? Is the bonus based on your personal performance or the company's performance or a combination of both? I would ask in how many years in recent past, have they actually paid bonuses? And did they pay them at 100% or less than at 100%? There's lots of companies that have bonus programs out there, but as a result of poor company performance, they actually haven't paid bonuses for years and years. So it's great that you're offered a bonus potential, but you wanna know a little bit more information about how frequently those bonuses are paid and what the bonus is based on. And if you're looking for a specific percentage or dollar amount, 
um, that may or may not be something you can negotiate. Some smaller organizations will negotiate. Some larger organizations that have very uh, rigid compensation bands and structures, they won't. There are large organizations out there that say, well, if you're a grade six, that means your bonus is 20%. If you're a grade seven, your bonus is 25%. And, and there is no negotiation on that amount. So it, every organization is different. So you just wanna ask what their, their philosophy is around how they pay bonuses. But the key, again, is to ask how many in recent years, how often have they paid bonuses and are they on track for, to reach their bonus goals for this year and what do they think it looks like for next year? And also keep in mind that bonuses are just that. They are not a guarantee. And even if you negotiate a, a great bonus percentage, say you negotiate a 30 or 40 or 50% bonus, in the fine print on your offer letter or in the actual um, compensation documents that are usually housed in the HR space, um, there's always fine print always fine print around bonus programs that read the following. Bonus programs are subject to change based on company discretion. So even if you negotiate that great bonus when you come in the door, it doesn't mean it will be there forever. So always know that and don't plan your life around bonuses. Plan your life around your base salary and your bonuses are just that, they're a bonus. All right. How do you respectively decline a, a respectively decline a video interview? Um, that would be a very difficult thing to do because in outside of COVID, you would be required to do an in-person interview. So I, I'm not really sure. Um, I, I guess I would have to understand more the reasons why you would decline a video interview because again, outside of COVID, would you decline to go into the company and interview face-to-face -face with someone? Um, so I, I don't really have a great answer for that because I'm not sure what um, response would be acceptable. If, I, if I'm in the seat of the interviewer or the recruiter right now, I can't think of something that would make sense to me from a candidate to say, well, I, I respectfully decline a video interview. There isn't anything that makes sense to me on that one. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. Um, it, I'm just not, I'm not sure. Um, cameras, cameras are flattering for, okay, so here. Cameras, I think it's, cameras are not flattering for folks over 50. I'm not a makeup artist and the cameras don't flatter you. Okay, so maybe what you need to think about is lighting. Lighting makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and, and I will say this, and, I, and I'm not trying to sell you guys anything, but I, I have developed a very robust interview training program called Crush It, um, and there's a whole section on video interviewing. Um, John Carlson, who I know is on, is actually a participant in the training course, and he can give you some insights in the chat if he'd like to about his experience with the program. Um, but we go pretty deep into the video interviewing scenario. Um, the angle of the camera makes a huge difference, and lighting makes a huge difference. You have to have light in front of your face, not behind you. And there is a Zoom setting, yes, Emily, um, there is a Zoom setting if you're using Zoom that you can click that will actually almost airbrush your skin a little bit to help you look a little bit more refreshed. Um, but out, if, if vanity is the reason you're not doing video interviews, that's not gonna be an acceptable response. I'm sorry, I wish I could make you feel better about it, but it's not. Um, but I can tell you that lighting makes a huge, huge difference. All right, let me see here. How do you handle a situation where you interviewed for a job you really liked and they said they moved on with other candidates, but the role is posted later, two weeks later? Um, they may have moved on with other candidates and those candidates didn't um, come to fruition, right? Either they didn't make an offer, they didn't accept the offer or what have you. So they're still looking. Basically, when a company says they've moved on with other candidates, that's just a, a polite way of saying they're not interested in hiring you. 
if they were, they would have moved you forward in the process. And I, I'm, I'm pretty direct, so I don't want to sugarcoat it and make you think it's anything other than that. Basically, they've moved on with other candidates and those other candidates haven't come to fruition. So the job is being posted again because they're still looking for the best fit or for the person that they think is the best fit. That's what that means. All right. Um, yeah, so I see that the anonymous attendee, um, a semi-professional lighting set up for less than 20 bucks. You can order desktop lights off of Amazon for less than $30. Um, I have some bigger lighting in here, which you might be able to see reflected in my glasses. Um, I will give you this one little tip. If you wear glasses and you have lights in front of you, um, even with anti-reflective lenses, you're going to get a glare take your glasses and tip them up so that they're at an angle like this, like the old Wayfarers used to be. And it will really help take the glare off. I don't know if you can see that right now, but if I have my glasses on like they normally are, you probably see the glare. But if I tip them just slightly up, it cuts the glare out. So that's a little tip that a professional videographer gave me um, a year or two ago when I was being interviewed on, on TV for something. So uh, there's a little tip for you. Okay. Um, guys, you guys have amazing questions. Uh, how do you handle a situ Oh, I did that one. How do you address why I don't wanna transfer from my current organization's branch to a new branch within the same organization, but in a different region? Um, I would say answering that question um, just depends on why you don't wanna transfer. If you don't wanna transfer because you absolutely love the team you're on and the work you're doing and the geography is convenient for you, maybe you have childcare nearby or what have you, those are all really legitimate reasons. If you don't wanna transfer because the other team is toxic and you don't like the boss or you don't want the role or what have you, I would be a little less um, willing to, to go down that path. So I would always focus my decline on the positives. I love the team I'm on right now. I'm, I'm happy um with the work i'm doing i'm learning i'm i'm enjoying what i'm doing uh from from a geography perspective this is where i want to be and i'm i'm just really not interested in in transferring elsewhere i mean that's how i would answer it um i i hope that helps if there's something um more to your decline and you want to, you know, you guys can always uh, direct message me on LinkedIn or, or what have you. Um, okay, hold on. The, the questions are coming so fast and furious. I feel like I'm looking at five different things here. Um, how do you prepare for a 30 minute interview with five people? What do they think they can gain in 30 minutes? Mike, that is likely more of an assessment of your ability to one, be in a pressure situation um, to handle multiple things coming at you at once, like I'm doing right now. Um, how do you handle yourself? Are you at ease? Are you comfortable? Are you able to make eye contact with all of the people in the room? Are you able to have at least some level of relationship building? Um, and, and we talk about this in the course as well, because I break down one-on-one -on -one interviews, video interviews, panel interviews. And one of the things we talk about is in panel interviews, you want to try to make a connection with each person on the panel, even if it's something very small. Um, and it, it could be, maybe you notice, maybe they're wearing a shirt that has a, an emblem from a sports team on it, right? You could even say, hey, you know, Mike, I really like that, that shirt. Unfortunately, I went to Florida State and that has a gator on it, but I like you anyway. Very lighthearted, not a big deal, but I just made a personal connection, right? Um, so you want to try to do that, but keep it quick and keep it moving. Hope that helps. Um, how would you suggest handling being ghosted following a formal interview or a pre-interview discussion with a recruiter? Uh, Nicole, that's a tough one. Um, I can tell you right now, recruiters and TA folks are overwhelmed. 
um, imagine what, what's happened as a result of COVID is that HR teams, TA teams, and recruiters, the size of those teams have been shrunk pretty significantly. And at the same time, millions of people out of work. So there's fewer people on the recruiting team and there's more people looking for jobs. So it's, it's almost impossible for some of these recruiters and TA folks to keep up with the volume. Um, and, and sometimes it simply is an oversight. So I, I encourage you as a job seeker, as frustrating as I know it is, and I've been ghosted myself, few years ago. Um, it's so interesting. I was actually approached by a company um, for a CHRO position. The CEO personally called me, talked to me, blah, 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 and basically said they were working up an offer and then they disappeared, right? It's, it happens to everyone. Um, so I encourage you to assume positive intent. Assume that they are overwhelmed, that they just simply can't get to it. And respectfully follow up. I would follow up every you know week or so but eventually you're going to have to accept that they've moved on with other candidates and if you were the candidate i assure you they would not forget about you and again i know that sounds harsh and i don't mean to be it's a little direct but at the end of the day recruiters and ta folks do not ghost the candidates they're trying to hire is it bad form absolutely should they take the time to give you a formal decline? Absolutely. I am not making excuses for bad behavior. I am saying, however, for your own sanity to just assume that they have moved on with other people and you continue down the path of your job search. If you have followed up a couple of times, then I would say just move on. Um, okay. Barbie, if basic qualification and education are having performed and having actual experience for the job being applied for compensate for the lack of education. Okay, so Chris, thank you, clarify. Bachelor's degree with five years of experience. Um, so some companies are very strict on um, educational credentials and some aren't. Some companies will accept experience, some don't. I say apply for the job. Um, one of the things, you know, there's data around this and it's, it's very interesting. Um, women tend to only apply for jobs for which they meet 100% of each and every criteria. Whereas men tend to apply for jobs if they meet like 50% or so, because they figure in their own mind that like, I'll figure it out. They're gonna love me, I'll get hired. Whereas women have more self-doubt. This is statistics, This I'm not making this up. This is actual data, you can research it. So my encouragement is apply for the job. The worst that can happen is they say, no, you didn't meet X requirement, but you're guaranteed not to get the job if you don't apply. Um, how should we follow up on interviews? Email, call, or both? Both. I would send an email as a thank you. And in that email, and again, we cover this in the course, but in that email, I would also um, ask them when I could expect to hear back from them. And if I don't hear back from them by X date, I'll shoot you another email just to check in, something like that. So, but I would definitely do both. Now, don't hound them every other day that is too much and that's setting um setting you up because what you don't want to do is you don't want that recruiter or interviewer or hr person to start to think of you as you know a pain in the ass because you're hounding them every other day you don't want to do that but you do want to respectfully maybe once a week check in um but if you've done that three times and you're not getting anywhere I would consider moving on. And if they're interested in you, if they are interested in you, they know how to find you. Okay. Barbara, uh, we actually only have a few minutes left in your webinar. So I don't know if you want to answer one more question or just wrap up, but you only have two minutes left. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, <laughs> it does, because there's so many great questions. Uh, Casey, are we able to capture all these questions? Yes, um, I'm recording them. So what I'll do is for those of you that have not gotten your questions answered, uh, I'm going to notate those and we're probably going to end up doing more of these since we've just gotten so much good feedback so far. So just keep yeah. an eye out and we'll make sure.
or we'll make sure to keep that. So if you're not following the business of HR, definitely do that. Uh, Cause that's where you'll see uh, the events get posted, but we'll definitely do more of these for all you guys that have not gotten your questions answered yet. Thank you. Thank you. So absolutely. We will do that. And you're giving me even more great content to add to the interview training course. Um, some of the questions I hadn't thought of. So thank you guys so much. Um, let me see. Uh, I'm trying to move into management. I get the interviews, but no one has pulled the trigger. Some places, states, a position will eventually move into management, but I heard that before. Um, I'm not, Linton, I'm not sure what you're asking. Um, so maybe you can, we can move on to another question. You can DM me or, or ask it in another way. Um, let's see, how do you handle a question going from consultancy to full-time employee? Also the projects are smaller in scope. So this may not be aligned on a corporate level. How do you overcome this? Um, you know, Alexander, one of the things I would say to that is, and this applies to anything, whether you're going from a consultant to an FTE, whether you're going from one industry to another or what have you is you want to find your core transferable skills. What is it that you did as a consultant that resonates and is transferable to the job as a full-time employee? What are the core competencies and behaviors and skills that you have that are applicable to that particular job? And we go into great detail um, in the course on competencies because in my opinion, understanding your strengths and your competencies and how to respond to questions anchored in behaviors and competencies is truly the key to getting the best information possible to the um, interviewers. I will share with you, this is a little bit of what the course looks like um, and the, the content so that you can be familiar with it. The course does have a 42 or 47 page workbook. I forget, I created it, but I don't remember anymore. Um, it's really in depth and we talk about um, a lot of the, the questions that you guys have answered and how to formulate your responses based in competencies, based in behaviors, and how to understand when you hear a question, what competency is at the core of that question. It's really important. Um, let's see, any other questions I can, uh, you're welcome, Mike, thank you for joining us. Um, are there innovative out of the box looking resume for, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, please do not get crazy with your resume. Um, I actually uh, have a, a friend um, who shared with me a resume he spent $800 for, and it was a tragedy. They tried to make it look pretty. They centered everything. It was pink and it was all, no, do not do that. Um, you want your resume to be easy to read, you do not want the font at eight. You want it at 10 as the smallest. You want a strong, bold headline descriptor. You want maybe a paragraph about who you are, some bullet points about your strengths, and then detailed bullets under the positions you've had. Do not get fancy and don't use tables. Applicant tracking systems cannot read tables. So if you have a bullet pointed list of skills in a table, um, the ATS can't read it. So use Microsoft Word and don't use Canva. Don't use all the fancy things out there. They look pretty, but they're not gonna get you where you need to go. So please do not do that. Um, all right, so thank you, Chris. I appreciate your feedback. Um, guys, this has been great. I don't even know. Oh gosh, we've gone over. Um, I, I could, I, I did Elwood's make it. Oh my gosh, I love you so much. I don't know how to say your name if it's Lucic or Lucic or whatever, but that's probably the best comment I've heard all day. Thank you. That's great. It, it has its own scent. <laughs> yes, it does. I love that. Her signature scent. Um, thank you guys so much. And Sandra, I'm excited to see you here. And um, John and, and Sandra and anybody else who signed up for the program and the group coaching sessions uh, tomorrow. Um, so I'm excited. Thank you guys so, so much. Um, please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm happy to help you as much as I possibly can. And um, I 
I enjoy all of this all the time. So uh, anonymous attendee, you have a great question about feeding off the energy of the person in front of you. Um, we, we do talk about that a little bit more. So thank you guys. I'm gonna sign off now because I know many of you are, it's probably past your lunch break. So um, enjoy your afternoon. Thank you so, so much.